Welcome back to the Life Changes Channel podcast. I'm your host, Dina Court, and today I'm bringing you a lovely lady who has faced some challenges and also she received some very interesting invitations in her life to go down a completely different route than she had expected and it's become her her purpose, her life's calling. She has also created a most beautiful new children's book that is something parents can benefit from as well. It opens conversations around values and situations that children and families could be facing and just how can you teach those things when maybe you aren't entirely sure where you stand on some of them. That's just one of the tools and services that she's going to tell us about. But first, she's going to share a very interesting story of even the past 10 years of her life and the transitions and the changes that they've faced and what it did for her when she was forced into being silent for, I believe it was three months. Hear why. It's not because she was in a monastery. <laughs> this, this is a really fascinating uh, place that it, her life took her so that she learned some lessons that then served her when she faced other challenges and changes in her life. So it's really fascinating. And it's an example of what is possible for you as well, how you can find that strength, how you can find that courage, and that you aren't alone. You can reach out and ask others about their experiences. Beyond that, if it isn't you that's experiencing, it also reminds us to be compassionate about what are other people going through. We just, we never know for sure what other people's stories are. So, you know, have some grace, less judgment and, and more compassion. There are a lot of resources available for you on the website that we have, Divorce Magazine Canada. Life Changes Mag is also uh, available for you. Lifechangesmag.com and DivorceMagazineCanada.com takes you all to the same place. And why? Because we have two magazines that many professionals, many experts share their stories and share their insights and their wisdom and a lot of valuable guidance to get you through some tough spots. The podcast has almost 150 episodes now. So, you know, scroll back through those, you're going to find some topics that I think you'll find interesting, or they might be something that you want to share with another person that you would like to support with some credible, resourceful information. If you would like to watch these as videos, all the episodes are on our YouTube channel and there's a uh, video content on Spotify as well. So if you would love to meet these people face to face, that's one way that you can do it. All of the contact information is in our show notes. So take a peek at those and it'll be easy just to click and it'll take you directly where you'd like to go. So let's get into this conversation with Laura Thomas and learn about her story and her triumphs and the beautiful tools that she's created to help you. Welcome, Laura, to the Life Changes Channel podcast. I am just so honored to spend time with you today. We've become friends and it's just a blessing when I can connect with you and just feel that beautiful energy that you bring to everything. And I am excited about a new project that has been created by you. And we're going to get into that more. And um, we've got everybody a little bit curious now. So please tell us who you are, Laura, how you would describe yourself and your why for what you offer to the world. And let's let's just let everybody know what a beautiful person that you are. Oh, thank you, Dina. Thanks for having me on the show. It's exciting to be here. Um, I feel like my natural response when you go tell everybody your why is how much time do we have? <laughs> Lots. <laughs> um, there's a lot. Um, I feel like, you know, having been through so many massive changes in, in my life and I would say specifically challenges that got me to a place of, of doing a lot of inner work and diving deeper into where do I get my value from and what is it that defines me? 
And that led me on this, this spiritual inquisition um, because I wanted to understand the essence of me beyond my personality, beyond my upbringing, beyond my psychology. Right. Um, I always had this feeling that we are bigger than our bodies, we are bigger than our minds and, and wanted to explore what that was and how I could be the master of creating my sense of self in a way that felt good for me. Um, and really, the journey has been an interesting one, um, for sure. I think some people know that I started my career as a professional singer and a voice coach. And um, I, I lectured at a university for many years and loved, loved that journey in many ways, but of course had a lot of learning that I had to do as a human being along the way. Um, one of which was definitely learning how to manage my own energies on stage, learning how to manage my mindset and my moods, because as a deep feeling and very sensitive person, when you're performing every night, um, you're not always in the mood. You're mm -hmm. not always in the mood. And, and so the discipline that is required is profound. Um, and more than that, you know, you really don't want to get out onto stage and 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 be blah with your mood. So you have to find a way, you know, you have to dig deep. Um, and for me, that was a soulful process of um, just reconnecting to my why in the moment, which was always to serve. Um, and then through the years of coaching people and seeing them work through their deep fears of enoughness, and seeing them conquer um, their concepts of self led me to then studying psychology while I was um, lecturing. And I think what's so beautiful is it, it ran parallel with my own spiritual, you know, discoveries and, and journey and definitely started to tap into more of my intuitive um, knowing and wisdom when I was coaching them with their personal stuff. Um, but I really had no idea the way that my career was going to, to take the twists and turns that it did. Um, you know, I was performing sort of most nights of the week and lecturing during the day, um, and my life was very full. But there was a certain point where my voice just, I don't want to say it gave out on me, but I thought I had a cold. I thought I was sick went to a doctor, got on medication that I knew was not recommended for singers because they put me on cortisone um, mm. on an ongoing basis. But in my head, I thought, it's just a cold. I'll get over this and then I'll be fine. And I wasn't recovering. My voice was getting worse. And I thought, what is going on here? Anyway, it led me down this this very long drawn out healing process where we realized I had reflux, really bad reflux that my vocal mechanism and throat and mouth were burned. Um, but I ended up because of just the way it physically manifested, having to be in silence for almost three months. Wow. Going from the schedule that you were living yeah, where you're speaking and using your voice every single day. And of course, in that time, beginning to think like, what does this mean? Am I ever going to sing again? Because at mm -hmm. first the doctor thought, oh, this will be quick to sort, but it, it wasn't, basically. And so what we thought was going to be 24 hours of silence became 48 hours, became a week, became several weeks. And then eventually... I had to go for surgery where I had, a, I had a blister on my vocal cords that wouldn't reabsorb, which it should technically. So they went in to shave it off. But then because of that and because we really didn't want anything to interfere with the healing so that there was no scar tissue on the voice, um, I had to do more silence. And let me tell you, <laughs> when you are in your own head 24-7, you do some soul searching. And for me, it was it was very significant because I thought, who am I with without my singing voice? Who wow. am I if I can't sing again? And, you know, I'd studied music and I'd studied teaching to, to teach and to sing. And I thought, like, I literally, at that point um, in my mind, was like, there's no point. I don't want to be here if, if I can't 
live my purpose, which I felt at the time was to help people through music. So that was my first moment where I really believed that the universe had quietened me on purpose. I don't believe there are any physical manifestations that are an accident. (laughs) And me, admittedly, I was stubborn at the time because I was so busy with my life that I don't think I was creating the time to listen. So the universe found a way (laughs) to get me quiet so that I could listen. And so that was, you know, a deep dive into where do I get my value from? And I will say I was in my 20s. I think I was probably 24-ish. And it was, I I don't think I was ready to hear what I was being asked to see, which was that as much as I love singing, I wasn't loving the environment that I was singing and it wasn't feeding my soul and it didn't feel aligned with me. I, you know, I felt, uh, you know, that imposter syndrome, but, but more just misaligned even with everybody backstage, the, the, the value system, the types of conversations, the, it, it was just m- not me. And I, I didn't mentally see another way to earn a living being a professional singer because I was, I was doing the shows that were the, the best paid shows um, as a singer. And so my ego and my human self was like, you just be quiet and carry on doing this because this is, you know, this is where you're okay. So I carried on with my life, but I adjusted the types of gigs I was doing and went into more corporate um, performing and studio work, um, but but was still teaching and, and all of that continued. And then I would say it was after I got married and, and we started trying for a baby and, you know, three years later and many miscarriages and really um, heartbreaking ones, you know. Um, I, it, I, the best description is that come to Jesus moment. But if, if I, uh, you know, describe it to clients, I'm often like, I was angry. I was angry with God. Um, I felt like I was being punished in some way. I felt like, how is this fair? And so again, I think it really did bring me to my knees and it forced me to reflect on my concept of what is God or the divine for me? Um, how do I believe this being feels about me in this moment? And um, I think I made a lot of realizations in my spiritual journey um, of how I'd always believed subconsciously that if you know, you're a good person and you do all the right things, then good things happen to you. And in that moment, it was like, but I don't get it. I'm doing all the right things. And... I had a, a counselor and a, a mentor at the time, and she said, oh, I, you know, I don't know why I'm feeling I need to tell you this, but you need to go to this animal communication course this weekend. I was like, okay. I, I had a dog at the time who was absolute, she was my soulmate. Um, and so I thought, cool, like if I can connect with her a little bit more, I'm going to go and do this. And so off I went, very um, last minute decision to do it. And I knew I had a busy weekend. I was performing Friday and the Saturday night, but I thought, okay, I'm going to go. And little did I know, and this is where I think the universe is so incredible because I wouldn't have gone had I known. Mm. The universe worked around you my wouldn't have gone. I wouldn't had have gone. Known. I would not have gone. And, and you'll understand yes. more as we go through, you know, what happened. But basically went on this weekend thinking, you know, having a concept of what this course would be, um, but really having no time to research it because I found out about it on Wednesday evening. I was lecturing Thursday, Friday. It just sort of happened, and I trusted, so off I went. And we got exposed to all sorts of animals, from horses to guinea pigs to um, iguanas to, yeah, just cats, dogs, you name it. And as we were getting into it, I was like, you know, I'm really, I'm like, I am able to answer these questions where I could see, you know, not everybody in the class was able to do this. And certainly by the Sunday, people were kind of giving me that look of, okay, <laughs> how's she doing this? And I didn't really know either. Um, I didn't understand it, didn't know where it was coming from. 
but I was able to tune into these animals and, and um, see their thoughts and see their, you know, their environments and, and get pictures. And But I didn't understand it. And I, I really left that weekend. And I, had, I can still remember having this thought of thinking, cool party trick, never going to use it. <laughs> Literally, because I was like, what are you going to do? Like, go up to people and say, by the way, your dog says. Um, so in my head, I was like, I'm probably never going to use this, but cool. But I didn't know that in learning how to still my mind and learning how to just be fully present, um, that that would open up the, the, the floodgates to mediumship wasn't trying, wouldn't have tried because I came from a very religious home. And so it was taboo. And mm -hmm. so hence I would not have gone that weekend right. if I had thought I was going to be talking with dead people. <laughs> so so Tuesday came and my, my students were on a study break and I'd agreed to, to come and meet with two of them to prepare them for um, – their exams and so I said okay guys like what would you like to do today and they said oh if we can just go through some of the you know the technical pieces so I said no problem sat down at my keyboard and was warming them up and one of the guys father came through to me and I bearing in mind this has never happened before okay so this is important side note and it was just strange. I, I, In the moment, my logical thought was, is this okay? Do, do I mention this? Is this legal? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Share this with the students? I don't know. But he wouldn't leave me alone. And I just, I think because I'd come off that weekend, in the weekend where I trusted myself, you know, you practice trusting yourself more and more, I thought, okay. There must be a reason for it. And so it flowed and flowed and flowed and flowed. And when it was done, and I say done, where, where I felt he stopped communicating, the lights turned off in the room. And I was sitting on a stage and the students were down sort of in the bottom in the seating area. And there was no one anywhere near the light. And of course, at this point, the... The one girl who was there was like, okay, I'm done. This is this is <laughs> just too much. And I, I was just kind of giggling, but also a little bit like, what just happened? And so I said, okay, guys, let's go and have a coffee break and we'll come back in a little while. And what happened was Lita, who was this young man, came to me when we got back and he said, Laura, you'll never believe it. But before you got to college today, I was sitting in that room over there and I was missing my dad so much because it had only been three months since he'd passed. And he said, I said to my dad in that moment, if you love me at all, you need to show me that you're around. And in this channeling, I, you know, very detailed things came through. Like we were doing a look in 18, which is a technical piece. And I said, he keeps pointing to 18. Why the 18? And he said, well, that's his birthday. And that's also the day he died. And he spoke about his legacy and, and that this legacy is now his son's. And, he, and Lita was at that point obviously crying. But he said, Laura, I know you don't know this because you weren't there, but my entire speech at his funeral was about the legacy he's left behind. Oh, and wow. So it was, it was this moment where, again, I was bewildered, not sure what was going on. Went home that day, and I can still remember going to my husband and sobbing. I was like, what does this mean? I don't know, like, what I'm meant to do about this, and I don't want to be a strange person because I've always seen myself as really logical. And I would say I was a little bit apprehensive of woo-woo stuff, and it probably came from my upbringing, mm -hmm. right? Yes. But he actually, in that moment, um, was so supportive because he just said, Laura, I really believe if you've been given this gift, it's it's for a reason and it's to serve and help people in some way. And it's quite amazing how everything that led up to that point then made sense. I had been told that 
it was about a week before I discovered my gift that the reason I wasn't falling pregnant was because I hadn't discovered my gift yet and that I'd be too distracted with children. And so that they needed to make sure that I discovered it first and then I could have my kids. And I fell pregnant, literally. This was in November that I had this thing and I fell pregnant in December. Wow. Uh, and bearing in mind that we'd had, you know, we tried fertility treatments and hormones and all the things and it had not worked before. So it was quite bizarre that we were not doing any of those things and it happened like that. So again, it was just this incredible um, awareness that there is something divine at work here and that it's bigger than me and that I needed to become, you know, more in line with it and more in tune with it because it was significant for me. And so from then, I really surrendered. I went, okay, I, I quit the one teaching job, which I was doing on two of my days, and within a month had filled that space doing readings. I don't even know how the people found me was, was through my, my mentor and therapist. And then word of mouth. And then, and then not even two and a bit months later, I left lecturing. And, and at that point, my husband and I realized we'd applied to come to Canada before we got married. So this was several years before. And because we had not been falling pregnant, we decided, well, we're not going to immigrate if we're not going to have kids because we don't mind being here. It's not safe, but... We'll stay in South Africa if if <laughs> if it's just us. So now we were like, oh my goodness, like our, we were still in the application process, but oh my goodness, now we are pregnant. What are we going to do? And so when we went back and looked at all the paperwork and where we were at, we didn't have any time to play with. We had to either move now. Right. Or we wouldn't have enough time to have been in Canada for long enough to 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 qualify. So there we were, six months pregnant, moving to another country. Oh. Having a baby in a country where we didn't know the doctors. We had one family friend, but they weren't people we knew well at the time. Completely alone, having a baby. Um, and I'm going to say that I think the adjustment from being surrounded by support and beautiful lifelong friendships and a big network of family to nothing was just huge, absolutely huge. I often describe it as feeling like you, you have this grief that you process of not only losing one person but losing every person that has meant something to you all at the same time but they're still alive and their life still carries on but your life has to carry on without them. And so it's it's almost a confusing grief, right? Because you feel this deep sense of loss, but you know they're still alive. And your sense of self, once again, is who are you when nobody knows you? They don't know your history. They don't know that you're, you know, a good person or, or your achievements or any of that. You are reduced to just a person. And... I really had to lean in on my relationship with the divine in that time um, on a very deep level of just going, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. It's, you know, it's just us, but I know that you're there and you've got me and, and I've got me. And I learned how to lean on me and build a relationship with me in such a, a powerful way. Um, and so I feel that it, it's through these big transitions, it's through these big moments of having to reestablish myself, who I am and who I get to be in the world, that I've developed a passion for helping people, you know, not only with loss and with grief, but with that transformative moment, whatever it is that brings them to their knees, where they go, you know what, this is, this is 
beyond my skill set. <laughs> uh, it's beyond what I currently know how to manage. And I love empowering people with tools and awareness and spiritual insights that allow them to feel in control of who they get to be. Right? We might not be in control of circumstances, um, but we can control how we show up, you know, not only in the world, but for ourselves. Um, I definitely think that over the years I've seen young moms dealing with that transition from being a single independent human being um, and, and saying goodbye and grieving that life as they then become more conscious in what they're creating as a mother. And mm -hmm. then what does this mean for me? Who do I get to be as a mom? Do my needs get to be met? Um, do I get to have fulfillment? Or is it, you know, basically taking care of my kids at my expense, which I think a lot of us struggle with. Right. Um, so for me, I think it has been... It's been this beautiful transition from originally coaching people through fear, through emotions, building their emotional awareness to be on stage, right. then studying psychology and harnessing that, then developing the mediumship. And then it was so beautiful how it just quite naturally started to um, merge together because as I was channeling certain messages for people, I realized how much my guides and the guidance I was receiving was able to use the database in my head, right? The, the information. And so quite naturally became almost um, mentoring, coaching or counseling, if you want to call it that, but um, in an organic way. And so that's been the last decade um, of my life now. Uh, my daughter's 10 now. And we continue to, to manage, um, you know, the changes that go through as your kids are, are getting older. So, um, you know, your, your life looks different. Your schedule looks different. Your um, adjustments have to follow. Mm -hmm. um, but I do have this desire to serve and support people in not only healing, but transcending the trauma. Um, because I, I also realized that it's so easy to get so focused on the brokenness and the trauma and the fractured sense of self that we, we reiterate it unintentionally and we expand it. And so for me, it's about saying, how do we acknowledge the wounding and hear the parts of us that need to feel witnessed and understood? and then love ourselves into a new way of being, um, you know, with a sense of focused direction. So as you know, I um, have added to my, my creative outlet um, writing a children's book. And this was not my own idea for me, actually. It was truly prompted by my children. And being a parent and going, I want to teach them values, you know, in a non-religious way, but I want to teach them how to be good people. And I bought so many books, but I, I wished, found myself wishing that there was a book that covered, you know, all the important things that kids would face and be challenged with, that sometimes as a parent you don't feel prepared with the answers or um, know how to explain in the moment, you know, sometimes it catches you off guard. And so this book is, I've already been reading to my kids every night since it arrived um, <laughs> in my hands, because it's it's just such a great way to teach them something through a story where you're not saying you need to be this, mm -hmm. but prompts a certain thinking. And then at the end of each chapter, there are these little questions that, you know, you can pick which ones you ask your kids. Um, but I love, my kids get so excited to, to each share their answer with me. And so they're getting to express themselves. You're getting to know little parts of their, their minds that perhaps you wouldn't have explored, right, without the right questions. 
So that is project number one, and we've got other projects that are um, in in process um, and arriving hopefully January. But this is my my excited project for the moment that we're looking forward to sharing with everybody. Oh, it's so exciting. I, I want to just comment on a couple things and unpack this a little. Yeah. Because your story is so powerful and you you really expressed it in a way that we could picture that journey. I think one of the most profound pieces of that, besides, you know, the the miscarriages and, and the challenges and the pain and the loss in that time, but which which people can kind of relate to. But when you left South Africa and left everybody you knew and went out on your own and the way you described that type of loss, it helped us wrap our minds around and build more compassion for people that we encounter in our daily lives. You, you know, I speak about this so often, things are not always as they appear and everyone has a story and that's relative to many, many areas of the human experience. But this is another new one to consider that I hadn't uh, really thought of that entirety. I, I have grandparents who did this, you know, post-World yeah. Wars, but then to hear you describe that again and how there's the loss, but it's like a confusing grief and you know they're there, but it's it's changed. And now here you are in this new country about to bring a new human into the world and just it's you and your husband. You don't know the systems. You don't know the people. You do feel safer, but it's in in a different way. So that I found really interesting. And the other part of the story was how this calling was bigger than you. You would have avoided it if you thought it was coming because of the conditioning. And I can relate to that, yeah. uh, you know, uh, kind of a strict religious um, outlook of the areas that are taboo that we might be tempted by, right? Um, things that you know, you have certain perceptions that you've been, it's been instilled in you. Yeah. It's so good to question them and be faced mm -hmm. with that. And maybe, maybe there's another way to seeing this or using it. And mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be for evil. It, it It's for good. And then when, when you listen to that and felt that that was bigger than you and it was, and you were a key player in this, mm -hmm. um, and there was no doubt. Like there are stories that I've heard from people where, you know, you could throw so much skepticism in, you can hear it in their voice a bit until they felt fully convinced. But talk about, there was no doubt. You're like those first encounters, it was so profoundly clear that, yeah. what, that this wasn't just a random idea idea of you were guessing some vague details maybe in that student's life or and if you hadn't followed your um your instincts we'll say to share yeah. it that day you wouldn't have had the confirmation that ooh this was a legitimate message it actually there's no other way I could have had this and yeah. the gift that you gave to that student as well. And now consequently so many other people because you allowed that to flow through you. Yeah. I, I have to say that is, it is a powerful message, I think, because it is easy to quieten that voice because it's not a loud, you know, scary, pushy voice. It's this gentle, loving, but in the moment it was assertive, but gentle. Um, and yeah, it would have been easy to ignore it. Um, and there is that element of not only trusting yourself that, you know, in that moment without even consciously analyzing it, I had to trust the essence of who I am and know I am a good person. So if this is coming through me, it's for good, right? This is for good. Yes. And I made a commitment to myself very early on, I think because of all that conditioning, like this is for the light. And it will always be for the life. That is my promise to myself and, and to everybody else that I work with. Um, but, yeah, it was, you, you're right. And, and in saying how clear it was, I'm so grateful it was so clear as well because I, I would have been the first skeptic. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> right? So I, I think the universe knew that and kind of worked with me and worked around me. But, you know, speaking back to that immigration um, process, I know that I had met so many immigrants in my life um, back in South Africa. And I, you know, regrettably didn't really allow the weight of that to sit with me. And so I look back and think, oh, definitely grown in my compassion um, for people, you know, going through such a huge change. Um, because it really is so much bigger than I think one can comprehend. Um, if you are energetically sensitive as well, the whole environment that you're in feels very different. And so for me, it almost felt like I was in another lifetime. Um, wow. It's the only way I can actually explain it because who I was and the network of people that I knew and the way that that felt and the energy vibration of Africa was, was a package deal. And now you come to this new environment, you're taking on a completely new role. You've got none of that support structure, which often in our sense of identity becomes part of our identity. And you're stripped away of that. And then the energy is different. You don't know what the cultural nuances are. Mm -hmm. And so if you are someone who's trying to be mindful of that and sensitive to other people's norms, you find yourself second guessing yourself where previously you'd been just comfortable in your own skin. Um, and I think that bottom line for me is when you do it from a conscious place, um, it's like you're witnessing yourself going through this the whole time you're going through it, which is, yeah, it's, it's just a, an enlightening and, and not easy process. And it has to be done with some intentionality instead of just like cruising through and getting by and, you know, what is the value there? What are the blessings in this? Yes. How about three months of silence? You know, yeah. like it's wasn't that, a choice. It felt like prison. It felt like prison. It felt, I used to joke with my husband at the time, it felt worse than prison. <laughs> I'm um, being someone who likes to express myself and uh, literally having to get a little uh, uh, whiteboard to to write things on to my husband. It was, sure, that was really um, a challenge. But, yeah, like you said, I think, thank goodness that prior to the immigration, I had that um, that spiritual connection and that awareness within myself because, I think it is so easy for all of us human beings um, in fear of uh, things we don't understand and, and realms that we haven't explored before to get stuck in a comfort zone of some kind, even if it's uncomfortable. And so when you move, you, you've kind of gone through so much change that everything in your spirit wants to kind of um, hibernate. Mm -hmm. And give yourself time to reestablish yourself and heal. And yet you know that the only way you can reestablish yourself is to put yourself out there. Right. And, you know, so it's almost like noticing the, the different feelings that you're having and then knowing which voices in your head to listen to. <laughs> the one that's afraid and, and is tired and just wants to stay at home. And the one that's like, I need to, I need to get out there and meet people. How am I going to do this? What are we going to do to shape this experience? Mm. Um, but I think at the end of the day, what and and let me add to that actually, it it definitely was not an easy time in my marriage. Because I think that to think that any relationship going through that type of transition where you're both missing your friendships, your supports. Mm -hmm. um, for my husband, a lot of his sports activities, you know, didn't exist in Canada. Um, which were huge outlets for him for stress. He began a completely new career. I fell pregnant with our second kid, was not planned shortly after we landed. And it was a difficult time for us because, again, we realized when you added all these external pressures, um, 
it's almost like the fine cracks were revealed in our communication or in, you know, our emotional um, understanding of one another. And, and so I think in that process as well, have explored and experienced all, all the, the nuances in relationship difficulties of loneliness and questioning things and will this work out and, um, you know, the decision-making of having faith and, you know, how much longer are we going to work on this? What strategies are we going to try? Um, and so I do feel that through that journey of, I believe, intentionally both carving our way back to one another, um, can can support people in their decision making process in going is this right for me is this the journey i want to pursue mm -hmm. you know or or has this revealed fundamental issues that i don't want to fix i don't want to work through um and i i don't take that decision lightly um and completely understand how heavy it feels to even be in the position to have to think about that. Definitely. And it's magnified multiple times when you are now facing these huge transitions, something that may have been underlying and just wasn't really noticed or realized. Yeah. And then yeah. it comes out and has to be, it has to be dealt with or it could just implode the the relationship, the home, and you don't you're you're you know blindsided maybe yeah. not even realizing where did that come from. So right. focused on the external, you know, it's outside and trying to get settled, and and re just not realizing in the under the under your roof what was going on. Right. And, you know, I, I do think what I've seen over the years with some of the couples that I have worked with is just our innate tendency is to point the finger at whoever is mm -hmm. closest to us, right? You're the problem. You're creating the, the discord in our relationship or it's your behavior that's creating the. And um, my father-in-law always used to say, when you're pointing a finger, you've got four fingers pointing back at you. Um, and I think it's so true in relationships that really if we – we want to see things shift. We have to begin with ourselves. Um, but I ultimately do acknowledge that there had to be that mutual decision made, um, that we were both on board, that for both of us, it was worth the effort. Mm -hmm. right? um, what we were creating, we, we had the same vision for what we wanted for our family. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. It, it, you know, yes, I think those issues probably were always there, but sometimes under pressure is is when they're revealed, mm -hmm. and um, it's an opportunity, right? It's an opportunity to learn together, or not. Um, well, and it's also opened up that opportunity to create something beautiful, not only for your children but for other children, so that they don't have to wait to be faced with that when they are under a pressure or they're in a difficult spot. And and that really came to my mind when you were describing the book and how you've very you know, uh, and I use the word intention again. It was intentionally created to offer life lessons through story and some prompts to have conversations around those lessons in a safe regulated space where now those are part of of their psyche they're part of their tools that they have available when they are faced with situations that may be you know depicted in these stories and now they can uh, pull from that and know that They've already had conversations around this type of thing with their parents. Okay, let's, now I've seen this in real life. This is how I responded. Maybe I wish I'd have done it. Like I'm, you know, reading a child's mind and thinking yeah. whether they consciously feel that or, or express that in those words, but they do sense that, oh, here's something that similar to what we read about. And I know we talked about it and I want to talk again, or I wish I could have, you know, I didn't quite do it the way I, would have wanted to, but let's explore that. And uh, even if there's a moment of a learning through maybe some discipline or a discussion that needs to be had, 
there's a reference that you can take it outside of, uh, you know, they aren't a bad person. They maybe made some bad choices or some could have made better choices or let's well, remember this story about whatever. So I love that tool that you've built and the way that it can be used for families to mm-hmm. dig into some areas and some values. And it's an opportunity to grow for everybody because the parents can also, you think, oh yeah, I have these certain values, whatever. But if you bring it into a conversation with a child, which is where you bring it to its most simplest, basic language, that's maybe something you need to hear or explore so that you know this is a value as a human and as a parent. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think um, for me, it, it's in those conversations that, you know, they're discovering what their beliefs are. What do I think about this? Hmm, who do I want to be in this situation, right? And as they're imagining the little characters in the story and their responses, you know, they're tuning in to, does this feel like it lines up with me? Like, is this who I want to be or not? And I I agree with you. I think that's so powerful because, you know, psychologically, we are far more likely to, to be motivated by something intrinsically from within than from outside of us. And so if they've had that moment of, this is who I want to be, um, it's going to show up differently in their behavior than, you know, a parent going, you should be, you Mm -hmm. should be honest or, you know, you should be kind or whatever it is. Um, And that's what I wanted for my kids. I wanted them to feel like, Hey, I'm giving you um, a concept here and I'm giving you the opportunity to choose who you get to be with this information. Um, And so the questions about, you know, how does it make you feel or how has it made you feel when you chose to be honest, even though it was difficult, Mm -hmm. right? Have you ever been dishonest? And then how did you feel afterwards? What was that like in your body? Because when they're, when they're reflecting on that, they know "Mm, that didn't feel good. Right. And so it's no longer an external learning. Well, and they, they are learning a new awareness Mm-hmm. approach to life in general yeah because it's like oh my there's messages here there's less like this means something if I'm feeling this way I, what caused that how come I'm feeling this way and they can apply that in all areas but they also have an opportunity to watch their parent grow and have and see their parent as not just this god on a pedestal that never has makes mistakes knows everything and has nothing left to learn they can now have an opportunity if that parent is willing to be vulnerable and transparent about what it's like, oh, I never thought of that, you know, during, say, if the book has prompted something or later it's come up in a conversation. And you could say, you know, that was new to me too. I had never thought about how I felt about these situations. Or you give an example and say, you know, today I I heard or saw this or said this or that. And I, it kind of made me feel good or bad, whichever, you know, it might be a a, a positive or a negative. And then that can open conversations that are very honest and, and approachable. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, when I have had those conversations with my kids, like you do feel so much closer with them. You feel connected in, in your intention as a little family to, to be better, to show up differently. Um, you know, I try to bring into the book stories on emotions and, you know, what each emotion is trying to, to teach us. Um, and there's a little guide in, in um, how to manage big emotions. Um, and it's got ideas on what we can do when we're feeling hurt or disappointed or overwhelmed or, or alone. And um, I just know that, that it's going to be an invaluable resource to, to kids and parents because secretly as i was writing it i was thinking you know this is going to be good for the parents too um where you know there might be one phrase or one thought that i'm hoping will plant a seed for them as well perhaps it's a seed of encouragement or to forgive themselves or to be um you know more gentle with the people around them whatever it might be um we all need that support sometimes and that reminder so the book is is brand new, brand new. 
it, it just came yeah. out a week ago, roughly from the recording of this episode. And we will share the links in the show notes, obviously, so you can order a copy for yourself. I've already gifted one to my grandsons. And uh, it's just my daughter's response was how at first glance, just how beautiful the illustrations, the book itself is just to look at, <laughs> let alone to dive into. So I encourage people to check that out. You can, and it's available through Amazon. So you can easily ship this as a gift directly from Amazon and, and send it out to uh, someone that you think this uh, would benefit. Besides the book, can you just briefly give us an overview of the other services and ways that people that you have that, and ways people can work with you? So there's, there's a, a wide variety of things that we do, but if we can, in a nutshell, say that um, I'm a soul alignment coach, just helping people to reconnect with their spiritual sense of self, a non-religious spiritual sense of self, um, where we're just connecting with the infinite part of ourselves, that higher awareness of our psychological being, our mental strategies, um, as well as just practical tools and support through whatever life is presenting you with. Um, whatever that is, I think we all have those moments where we realize either I can't manage this on my own the way I'd like to, or maybe I really love to do this with support and have somebody guide me lovingly um, so that I don't feel I'm just, um, you know, strolling around in the dark, so to speak, mm -hmm. and help people to feel that divine sense of support as well. So my services range from individual sessions, which I call soul sessions. And in those soul sessions, we, we do everything from, you know, a reading, like a life reading on where you are, what we're seeing for you, what your gifts are, the things to be aware of, to energy alignment meditations where we connect with your guides and, and supportive beings. And I've got an online coaching program that we do on Sundays. And that is for people who want um, the repetition and the structure of support around them if they know they tend to go off and do well for a little while and then, um, you know, fall back into old habits. So the, that program has been structured around um, spiritual learning and lessons as well as mindset learning and lessons and then practical tools and individual um, coaching as well. And then mediumship, of course. Um, it is... It isn't my most common session, but it is always um, beautiful and, and special. So um, couples work, I tend to do um, with people who've seen me individually and say, hey, do you do couples work? And then we, we work together um, because it's, it's niche, right? I'm not focusing necessarily on um, specific issues or um abusive situations i would say that right. i would probably refer people on to someone else but for people who know that they're they're not in alignment with their highest self they know their partners feel the same way and they feel like they are not connecting on a deeper level mm -hmm. and want to return to that love and have practical um, tools and then personal insights as to what they needing to work on to, to show up in an improved way in their relationship. Right. Amazing. So, yeah. We will, and we'll have all that contact information available in the show notes for people to reach out and explore these with you and see what might be a, a fit for them or they're just curious. So yeah. thank you for spending time with me today and, and your story that really can encourage people and give them hope for uh, whatever type of transition they might be feeling alone and stuck in and and that there is a community of people who care and would love absolutely. to help them absolutely thank you so much for for conversing with me and sharing your space with me it's been wonderful and i do hope that um that someone somewhere will take an, a little bit of a nugget away from today that allows them to just feel not alone I hope you found that conversation 
insightful, encouraging, and also a reminder to all of us that what we see isn't always as it appears. People are going through a lot of things in their lives and we would want that compassion shared to us and that is something that we can offer to others without judgment. Instead, be curious and, and reach out, reach in, figure out a way that you can make someone's day a little better and it might just start with a smile. I thank you very much for spending your time with me here today and I encourage you to please subscribe to the fo- podcast follow us on social media, check out our events. We have lots of ways that we can help you or someone that you love. Share this with a friend. If there's someone that you know could benefit from this and hey, keep smiling that beautiful smile because the world really does need your sunshine. It means a lot that you spend this time with us and meet our experts and professionals who can help you through whatever life changes you're facing. Please refer to our terms of service available on our website, lifechangesmag.com. The link is in the show notes. Our disclaimer, Divorce Magazine Canada, Life Changes Magazine and Channel and Divorce Resource Groups are intended to educate and provide quality, credible resource information. The contents should not be used as factual until consultation with the appropriate professionals for any guidance. Divorce Magazine Canada, Life Changes Magazine, Life Changes Channel, as well as the Divorce Resource Groups, do not constitute endorsements for, nor liability for any claims made in the presenting of this information.